Um, I am a little curious, just to make sure I understand the format. Can my panelists see the participant list? You can't see that. Okay, so um, I will figure out a way to, um, to make that visible to you all. But so far, we have um, 30 people joining us, and the numbers still keep ticking in. Um, so I'll tell a little bit about what you're looking at, which is the screen, um, the launch page of um, EngagedTheory.net, which is really the Engaged Theory community space for finding each other. And today is the first, um, our launch event and the first of two sessions in which we'll introduce how we do this work, um, hopefully as a call and invitation for you to share how you do this work. And assuming that uh, time allows, maybe some of you who do this work would like to um, share your thoughts or questions during the Q&A portion. Um, and if that goes well, we will um, uh, we'll have more of these events. So without further ado, I want to start by thanking Monique DeVoe for um, reaching out about creating a space. She also did a lot of work to figure out what a good space would look like um, and to appreciate all the other spaces that do similar things. I also want to thank Chris Tanove, who um, had for us the idea of the minimum viable concept. So we tried to begin building this space in a way that um, that would be open and those of you who were interested in having such a space could see a place for you to bring your ideas about how we could make this a, um, a vibrant virtual community. Not all of us work on climate, but all of us are facing it. And so the more we can figure out how to do these things well virtually, the, the better off I think we, we all will be. <clears throat> and um, last but not finally, um, Genevieve Fuji Johnson, who's been a collaborator, um, in this work for a really long time for me personally, and uh, she will be um, at the next session, at the afternoon session, as, along with Chris. She um, brought to us Courtney, Ett, who really helped us facilitate um, the design layout of this. This is not um, not something that is our particular forte. We're going to stick in our lanes in certain respects, though. So I'm going to move quickly into um, answering the three questions that we posed for our panelists today, um, for myself, and then I'll turn to Catherine, then Diva, um, and then we'll close out with Monique. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming. This is pretty exciting to have um, so many of you sign up at pretty much a, a random invitation. And what we've asked everybody to do is to think about how and why we do this work. Um, so the first question um, I posed, or we decided to pose to everybody, is which call for engaged political theory do you answer? And I'm going to um, answer this with a story about how my work began. I began as a political theorist um, in 1992, working with Susan Oaken. We did not have a big theory um, community. Uh, there were there was one student ahead of me. One, came, one or two came in with me, one or two behind me. We weren't um, in a place where um, theory was uh, a very strong culture. And immediately I started reading um, Martha Nussbaum, her work um, that then became the full-blown version of the capability ethic. Um, and I had come to this work myself through um, work in uh, unsecured credit. So I had worked with organizations like BRAC and the Green Bank, Finca in Latin America. I'd worked through Save the Children to look at a huge variety of these organizations and I was aware of one of them that um, Martha Nussbaum used in a very vivid way and that was BRAC. And our argument about BRAC was that the workers of BRAC had convinced these rural women who otherwise didn't want their education um, that education was valuable for women in other countries, and so these women came to appreciate that it would be valuable for them. In other words, she was using this illustration to um, start to confirm some of the elements of, um, of the categories of the capability ethic that we have come to be familiar with um, in her perfectionist form of it. And my concern was that wasn't quite true. So I left to do field trip, field work in Bangladesh before I had actually gotten into um, participating in conferences, engaging with other political theorists in, a, in the 
um, in the norms of the field. And what I found in, in Bangladesh was that my intuition was correct, that Martha Nussbaum had engaged in a confirmation bias. She had an understanding of what the capability ethic was, um, highly informed by Aristotle, but not exclusively. She had been engaging with anthropologists as she developed the view, but she lacked a methodology of accountability. She lacked a methodology of questioning her own epistemology. And so what called me to do grounded normative theory was that disconnect between the commitment of wanting to work on issues of global justice and um, making the world a better place in a very uh, general way, but being concerned that the way that um, we do it really mattered. And so for me, I'll move to the second question, which is um, how do I do this work? What are my methodologies? And I would say that the first thing um, is probably something that echoes Ian Shapiro, which is that you have to use the right tool for the right question. So um, the question um, that should be asked, though, prior to that is, are you asking the right question? So how do we do political theory about these issues in a way that holds us accountable for asking the right question, the question that matters to the people who are in struggle, um, the struggles that we care about? So finally, that brings me to, um, to the answer to the question, how do I use it in my work? Um, I guess the short answer is to worry that I too could be Martha at any given moment, that I need a way of being, uh, not in um, many of the ways in which we appreciate her, obviously, but in some of the ways of um, worrying about epistemic um, considerations. So how do I hold myself accountable for um, and to the people and the struggles that bring me into the field of political theory in the first place. Um, and the key is to be aware, to me, is to be aware of epistemic privilege. Um, that means that um, I need to be comprehensive in my work on, um, on some questions that hasn't generally it had to mean slow, but um, so in my work on human rights and the work that came out in Universal Human Rights in a World of Difference, I wasn't particularly slow. We did interviews, I wrote the book, um, but I work on climate and governance in both Bangladesh and now in, um, in a low-income community in uh, Tennessee, it's got to be slow. It's always got to be relational. That is, um, it takes time to build relationships and to make sure that you are being accountable. It's important to be collaborative, not just in methods. I use a lot of methods in which I'm not particularly virtuous. So, um, so I work in a lot of collaborations, particularly on the scientific side. Um, and therefore, it also means that I'm being multi-method and sometimes mixed method. But all the time, the idea for me is to be comprehensive or as comprehensive as possible, recursive, reflecting on whether I'm doing a good job of that and coming back to it, and always centering epistemic politics, both in terms of inclusion, but also in terms of accountability. So um, welcome everyone. I will now follow the chat and see if I can address the issues that are being raised there and turn to Catherine who will introduce her work and, um, and her project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke, for organizing this and for including me as well. Can you all hear me all right? Great. Um, so should I share my screen now? Okay, well, thank you so much, Brooke, for inviting me and, and to all my fellow panelists. Um, I, I will try to just talk for five to seven minutes maximum because I, I want to hear what everybody else has to say. Um, so briefly, you know, I, I'm not very well versed actually in, in what grounded political theory is, but I just wanted to maybe give also like Brooke a little, you know, um, a summary of my own intellectual development and influence to maybe explain like how I I'm doing political theory and why it is quite strikingly different, I think, from, say, the most important political philosopher that I studied in graduate school, which was John Rawls. <laughs> so I'm sure everybody studied Rawls' theory of justice. Uh, I you know, was in grad school in, in the mid-1990s, uh, late 1990s. Um, and, but what I found fascinating is that although I you know, understood at least uh, the power of Rawls' thought, there were other theorists who attracted me much more. And, and so I found that interesting itself. Um, 
And I would just say that the two most important intellectual influences for me were Judith Schlar and Iris Marin Young. Now, I, I do think, again, it's interesting why I was drawn to them. For Schlar, I was really drawn to her because of her references to ancient Greek tragedy, which I, I loved reading as well for its complexity. Um, also in her references to history. One of the things about Schlar that I find interesting is, you know, although she was writing in a way about human rights and genocide and war, she certainly didn't only talk about post World War II. She talked about, you know, uh, the Spanish uh, uh, conquest. She talked about um, the, you know, indigenous um, uh, dispossession. And, and so her, her sense of history was much longer. Um, than I think a lot of uh, more contemporary works. And also she referenced literature, which to me are just like great you know, stories that help us also to disorient a little bit the conventional ways that we think about things because literature generally as great literature has to be multi-perspectival. And so this is, I think what I enjoyed about, about that as well. Um, but I thought that Schlar's kind of political thought was, uh, was basically very well grounded in human experience, uh, whether captured through literature and art or through actual historical narrative um, and, and contested historical narratives. And, and this is what drew me to her work. Uh, also, I think Iris Marin Young's work um, as a critique of Rawls and, and the sort of impartialist, uh, idealist, universalist approach was like, again, incredibly refreshing to me, the way that she theorized social groups and, and also oppression as not just being interactional or, or about one tyrant, but, but about structural oppression um, and her, of course, understanding of structural injustice. So, you know, just to give you some ideas, like here for, for Schlar, what, what drew me to her uh, lecture faces of injustice, or it was actually three, three of them, but, you know, her, her critique of the normal model of justice to me that was very compelling, the idea that whatever theory of justice we have, it really cannot capture ultimately the enduring character of injustice and the multifaceted uh, account of injustice as a social phenomenon and her arguments about passive injustice and the victim sense of injustice, you know, being important to, to at least understand and analyze as, as part of theories of justice and, and their limits, I thought was incredibly useful uh, for at least my own conceptualizations and my own orientations, I think. Uh, again, Iris Marin Young showing uh, us what a critical theoretical method is, a kind of normative reflection that is historically and socially contextualized. So again, you know, to, to basically, make the argument sharper here, I think I was like Young, not impressed by arguments that start with everybody in a lifeboat or that start with us trying to hit people or not hit people in a trolley problem. I mean, these kinds of problems, well, I think they can help analytically to sharpen like what's at stake. You know, again, to me, we're not uh, reflective of, um, you know, history and, and social context and, and, and sort of the development of of our ideas in actual societies and, and how they operate. Um, so in my own work then, just to jump very briefly to uh, a book I published in 2017, Justice and Reconciliation World Politics. I mean, basically this book was uh, spawned by my somewhat huge dissatisfaction with uh, a lot of the literature in international relations and political theory on justice and reconciliation, uh, especially in world politics. My main dissatisfaction was with uh, what the concept of transitional justice meant, uh, which really meant a kind of focus on like individual accountability through punishment or reparations for you know, what are acknowledged to be atrocities or severe human rights violations, you know, but they were always in this kind of interactional framework. Um, and I kind of thought, well, actually like the biggest injustice in world politics that has yet to be addressed is, is colonial injustice. Mm -hmm. And I tried to apply, you know, transitional justice mechanisms to colonial injustice and really found them lacking. Actually, that is an interesting point. Like in about, I think 2000 and, you know, 13 or so, I, I thought I could maybe write a book about justice and reconciliation. And I was looking at the usual things, you know, World War II. And I happened to come across the case of the, um, the Japanese, uh, military system of sexual forced labor and slavery. And I realized, oh, you know, this case of, of comfort women, so-called comfort women, 
basically was not yet addressed. And I thought that's kind of odd. I thought that, you know, there was all this, um, you know, Nuremberg, and I, I thought there were, you know, reparations. Uh, and, and so I thought that was very odd to me that there were colonial subjects of Japan who didn't receive any compensation for uh, what were recognized, you know, atrocities and, and severe human rights violations. Anyway, that then basically made me realize that my book had to change focus. And, and so, you know, instead of publishing a book in 2014, it came out in 2017 instead, but with, I think, a much better focus, which, you know, then looked at uh, really the problem of how colonial war and genocide and, and you know, basically major uh, atrocities have never have not ever really been addressed and, and how we still fail to address them despite the fact that we supposedly have now all these mechanisms of, of transitional justice in the toolkit. And of course, being from Canada, the issue of Indigenous peoples and their genocide and cultural destruction and dispossession has you know, become very salient, especially since 2015. Um, and, and so the idea that colonialism is not over and settler colonialism is not over and how important it is not to look at colonial injustice only as historical, but as a reproduced structural injustice was to me you know, kind of the most important part of what I wanted to contribute. Um, as you can see, though, I really had to read up on a lot of historical cases. And I can talk a little bit more maybe in Q&A about the problems that I see as a political theorist and not a trained historian, being a consumer of historical works and, and how you know, one goes about um, doing that. Because obviously, a lot of narratives are contested. Um, but, and I also realized like when sociologists or anthropologists look at these cases, they also try to make normative arguments. And in a way, many of them are not very well equipped to, to make those arguments. So here, I think there can be collaboration perhaps between anthropologists, sociologists, and historians um, on, on working out like what would the normative implications be? I, I'm not sure if I'm out of time already, um, Brooke, but just, yeah, am I out of time? Okay. Okay, then I will stop there and just to say, you know, these were the kind of questions then that I tried to address in, in my book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this is great. Just how we wanted to get started. Dave, are you ready? Are you going to share a screen or are you going to... Um... I'm not. I'm not going to share a screen, um, but I, I am ready. You are um... you. All right, excellent. Please introduce <laughs> Um, yes, so um, I'm really pleased to sort of engage with these questions and honestly I have so I have so many of the um, sort of similar experiences, Catherine, to be honest with you, <laughs> in terms of what has, um, you know, brought me to study uh, theory in the way that, that I do. Um, I should say first that um, I came to study um, theory because um, the works that I was most inspired by in graduate school uh, were absolutely not um, total theories of everything. Um, <laughs> I disliked total theories of everything, actually, um, in, in ways that I couldn't quite put my um, finger on, except through the work, um, which is also a major touchstone work for me of Iris Marion Young, who I also had the privilege that she was my teacher. So, um, so I don't think that I would have done theory at all if not um, for that uh, context and for the permission to engage with theory in a way that um, um, prioritized um, its connection to the world and its contingency and flexibility. Really, I, I mean, those things were just very important to me. Um, and, um, you know, technically my first field is um, empirical American politics. And I um, learned the sort of like requisite methodologies to do that work um, in, in graduate school, um, but was always really interested in and moved by the, um, the um, theoretical questions and felt also that I couldn't ask the kinds of questions I wanted to ask about the world and the possibilities of meaning making and world building without theory. Like it was just not possible for me, but I was actually, it was actually quite um, fraught um, uh, it is sort of during my graduate education because I kept getting asked at intervals, so what are you really, really, what's your first feel? Oh yeah, it was like very intense in that way. Um, and, and very much like, and I remember actually having a conversation with um, 
you know, with Iris, Mary and Young, like, I don't know what to tell people. Like, uh, you know, like I'm like, I don't know what this means for getting jobs. Like, I don't know how to sort of pitch myself as a scholar because I know that the thing that I'm most interested in are political and public meanings and political possibilities and action. And in order to investigate these questions, I really feel like I'm gonna need the tools um, from both of these subfields and I don't want to be made to choose. Um, and, and, you know, what she said to me was, um, um, basically you can position yourself however you want, um, as long as you have mastered the tools. Um, and so, um, so strategically, I chose co-chairs for my dissertation, um, <laughs> one who was a theorist and one who was, um, American politics and designed a dissertation that, um, I tried to utilize to sort of pass muster in both, uh, according to the standards of both uh, fields, um, but really undergirded also with a kind of reflection back to an earlier period of political science, um, you know, characterized by the works of like Albert Hirschman and E.E. E. Schatzneider, um, which was basically before the split between empirical political science and political theory and trying to sort of model my projects um, structurally um, on those in a certain way so that there was a feeling of familiarity when people encountered the works, um, even though um, um, I was also doing something that had become challenging in the field. Right. Um, it, so it was a little bit of also kind of making a reference like you read these works you know how important they were, you know how much they informed you about the world and how to think about politics. And I also want to do this kind of work, <laughs> you know, like this is also the kind of work that I want to do. And I don't want to hew to arbitrary distinctions um, about, um, you know, um, what part of the subfield I'm living in. Um, I have to say that it was actually quite hard to do during the first part of my career. But during this part of my career, it's been um, the most beneficial, the most beneficial thing, right, in terms of um, creating work that I find engaging and um, endlessly fascinating and that also seems useful to other people. Um, and that is always the um, sort of for me synchronon of of the work is when people are able to take it up in different pieces and parts and utilize it to explore their own um you know fascinations and to um you know undergird their work in the world as well and so yeah i mean i think that that's um, you know, that's the reason that I came to this study and or studying things in this way. And the reason that I do think of myself um, as both an engaged theorist and an engaged empirical political scientist, because for me, there is not um, a hard separation between those things. And my works will always meld both of those things. Um, and that's partly because, like Iris, I feel like I am um, just a tool user. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not creating um, any total theories because I don't think that um, human beings are ever to able to um, build worlds that are actually totalizing. Um, so they're just it's just an inaccurate way to approach, I think, knowledge production. Um, so instead, I approach knowledge production from the point of view of I'm a person who's using tools that have been amassed by people over a long period of time, right? Like a 3000 year conversation. <laughs> and I want to, you know, um, build things that may be informative and useful to people in this time and place and differently useful to other people um, in future times and places. But I want them to be able to use the tools that I put on the table as suits um, the political time that they exist in. Um, so that's really my goal um, and um, what I hope for my scholarship and also what I try to encourage in the scholarship of, um, you know, folks, you know, students and junior scholars who are coming up is to just um, try to think through and show us how you're thinking through um, the world as it is um, and um, how you are practically imagining the world as it might be. Um, so, 
so yeah, um, the way that I use these sorts of uh, sort of convictions in my own work is through um, multi methodological projects on a variety of different topics. Um, my most recent work is um, a book about um, democracy and social movements called Reckoning, um, uh, Black Lives Matter and the Democratic Necessity of Social Movements. And the book is a blended project that engages in some um, sort of reportage of um, the political philosophy of the movement and how I think that it should inform us about um, uh, 21st century political thought. Uh, but also um, some thoughts about social movements place in democracy as democratic as a democratic institution. Um, and this work is, I should say, empirically grounded. Um, my approach to things is always inductive. I also do not begin with being in a lifeboat or, <laughs> um, uh, you know, in the state of nature or anything like that. I, I begin with the world as it is, at least the part of it that I can describe based on evidence. Um, and then theorize um, from that moment, right, of, of concrete experience. Um, so the book is based on interviews and the theorization of it grew out of those interviews um, and um, then drawing on the works, the theoretical works of, of people in, um, you know, wherever they exist in political thought from um, contemporary American, uh, you know, um, political thought to, um, you know, ancient political philosophy. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, I mean, I guess I just, I just try to um, be aware of what each of the kind of methodological tools that I use are good for, and to utilize them in the way that um, best suits them, you know? That's great. Thank you. Best suits them and the scholarship. So thank you so much. Um, this has been a perfect introduction. I'm going to hand it over to Monique to close out our introduction. And then we are now uh, 34. So it might be a little cacophonous, but after Monique's remarks, my plan is to ra raise, <laughs> to invite all of the attendees um, into the space so that we can see each other and have a conversation. Um, and if you have something you want to say, I think I can follow the Q&A and the chat and everything. Um, the raise hand function sometimes works for me, so maybe, maybe not. But I'll do my best to follow what you put in the chat. Monique, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. I'm really excited to be doing this work to try to amplify you know, grounded and engaged political theory. Um, I, I work in a philosophy department, so we're uh, so doing this kind of work uh, uh, is 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 seen as a little odd. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited that that uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the last you know five years even about the use of interpretive methods in political philosophy. So and I can see that there's some participants here that that write on that. So that's great. So the, call, the, the calls for engaged political theory that have most influenced me in recent years are those of uh, critical poverty researchers and activists. Um, you know, basically the insight that poverty analysis and policy really needs to be grounded in the experience of those living in poverty as a matter of justice. Uh, this insight sh shaped the way that I approached uh, the research and, and writing of my book, uh, Poverty, Solidarity and Poor-Led Social Movements. Um, in terms of the methodological discussions that have informed me, certainly um, everything that's been mentioned so far, um, and I, um, I would say in the background, um, the shift away from non-ideal, sorry, uh, from ideal theory, or, or what Charles Mills calls idealized theorizing, uh, the shift away from that as a matter, as a method of analyzing injustice has been tremendously important. And I've learned a lot from thinkers who, who've made the case for the need for non-ideal theory um, as the right framework for taking proper account of uh, context of subordination and exploitation. Um, because I'm also working in development ethics, I'd say that, that uh, work by radical development ethicists and practitioners uh, has been Im important, the debates that they've had about what, what community-led uh, social change looks like uh, and, and community-led uh, development looks like, um, social movement-led uh, transformation as well. So some of the ethicists uh, that have um, been important to my work are um, Robert Chambers, John Gaventa, um, Nyla Kabir, 
And I take from, from their work that uh, theorizing about poverty needs to begin from a close empirical study of the, of the actions and aims of poor communities and their organizations, including how they reimagine cooperative and solidaristic forms of housing and work and, and so on. Um, and for many working in this area of development ethics, social um, movement organizations uh, become research partners of academic researchers. And that's a lot of that research informs my recent book. Uh, so there's rich discussions by activists and NGO workers and critical development researchers about how, how to do that kind of research. Diana Mitlin uh, is, is someone whose work is, uh, has influenced me a lot. Um, a, th um, a third um, methodological discussion that has informed me is philosophical writing on epistemic oppression and epistemic resistance, um, you know, from Bell Hooks's work, uh, her essay, Marginality as a Site of Resistance, uh, to Jose Medina's work on the epistemology of resistance, uh, Christy Dotson's work on epistemic oppression, um, and uh, Boaventura de Suso Santos, his work on what he calls uh, epistemicide and the suppression of epistemologies of the South, um, also helped to kind of frame um, the way I approached uh, my writing on poverty. Um, and lastly, workers, uh, sorry, work by thinkers who caution us that um, that there's a problem with focusing strictly on the oppression of communities, um, that this can obscure the knowledge and the counter practices that have emerged from these communities. So uh, Eve Tuck, for example, um, her, her work on what she calls damage centered research um, has influenced me. Um, she writes about how this can pathologize communities um, and invisibilize members agency um, and uh, I, I think it's important to heed her, um, her, her cautionary tale about how so much social science research relies on a problematic theory of change, uh, whereby reparations are thought to depend on making the case that damage and loss has happened. It's like a kind of litigation framework. Um, and that there are really good reasons to think that this is not how social transformation will, will happen. Uh, Tuck proposes rethinking community engaged research methodologies with a view to shifting away from the, which, you know, the damage centered uh, research framework. And I do think that um, many of the engaged methodologies that we're talking about here um, do point to the alternative political imaginaries uh, that, um, that we, that we uh, need to put into the foreground. Um, JK, uh, Gibson Graham's work also on the politics of possibility that talks about how it's so important to um, to spotlight uh, alternative uh, economic activities, solidaristic cooperative uh, economic activities that um, that have emerged from late cap late stage capitalism. I would say that's also been formative for me. Um, how do I use it in my work? Um, well, I really just do it by centering poor, poor led social movements in my writing on poverty. Um, I mean, I, ha I have done sort of field work in the past for previous projects, but with the, um, the most recent uh, work, what I did is, is just try to uh, develop my own normative, normative arguments uh, from my study of poor led social organizations and movements, rather than these movements just being examples used to illustrate my own theoretical claims. Um, and uh, so my theorizing was directly informed as, uh, as in the case of, as Diva explained about her research, um, the theorizing I did was directly informed by my study of these groups. I, I didn't know what normative arguments I was gonna make until I had spent a lot of time learning about poor led social movements in diverse settings. Um, so I didn't do my, my own interviews for this project. So it's not an ethnography um, and, and there's no rich qualitative uh, interviews. Uh, and instead I just drew on the vast uh, scholarship on groups and movements um, that, uh, um, you know, I, I zoom in on particular ones, but, um, but a lot of this work is by academics, but some is by scholar activists, and there's also materials put out by social movements, the websites, uh, you know, reports, manifestos, and so on. Uh, I, I'm just going to close by saying I'm, I'm aware that this method doesn't meet most of the criteria for socially engaged research. 
Um, there's no uh, there's no accountability. Uh, there is some recursivity, um, but uh, my research didn't involve partnerships with these movements or activists. Um, I, I, I am inspired by the work of scholar activists and people um, who do research in ways that align with the goals of justice seeking communities and I'm learning a lot from that uh, uh, from that work um, and and hope to uh, hope to be able to do a new project that um, that incorporates those methodologies. I'll end here because I think it, it is valuable to, to, to discuss this question about whether there is much value to the, the kind of theory, uh, engaged theory light um, that I just described that I do um, that remains really in the space of translation. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering whether others think that we should be doing more um, of the kind of direct community engaged uh, normative theorizing uh, despite the challenges and perils of this kind of uh, of, of this kind of research, um, or you know, if engaged normative theory is to be conceived very broadly, like on a spectrum from the solidaristic research models um, that you know that we that we know to uh, to this more uh, engaged light approach, like mine. Um, that merely incorporates others' empirical others' empirical research. Um, is there then much value to having a network like this one, this engaged theory community? I, I think there is, but I would really like to hear from the rest of you whether uh, whether you think there is, and um, and and why, uh, and what that could be. Thanks. Excellent. So um, those closing remarks follow pretty nicely uh, toward what the panelists are, uh, what the audience is asking for. I'm going to do my best to uh, figure out how to migrate everybody up. Um, yes, on the website we have a bibliography and um, the references that people have made today um, are going to be available alongside the posted version of this, um, of this, uh, this webinar and then there'll be a comparable one. Um, so I'm, I should have probably started my um, graduation practice earlier in this because I don't see a graduate all, but that's what I'm going to move us to. And I'm also going to add um, the uh, the auto transcript, assuming that's actually going to work, um, because we want to make the final version of this as accessible as possible. So that's what I'm going to work our way toward. Are you guys getting graduated or is that not happening? Looks like it's not happening. Now let me work. I'm gonna phone a friend. Let's start with. There we go. Okay. So maybe not everybody's accepting being graduated. That's what's happening. All right. You do not have to accept being graduated. You can stay where you are, I guess. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, one of the folks who's joining us is um, Fauna, who is uh, in the webinar that we'll have this in my time zone this afternoon. Uh, excellent, welcome. Hi, Fauna, did you wanna pop in and say hi? Hi, <laughs> that was <laughs> the, the opening uh, 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 mini talks were, were just illuminating. It was a wonderful way to begin uh, the conversations today. My mind is just like racing and sizzling. So thanks everybody for those opening comments. So one of the things I noticed was the um, the multiplicity of uh, of perspectives that brought people to a relative commonality in terms of being reflective about what what it means to consume somebody else's scholarship in a critical way and yet rely on and utilize it. Diva doing her um, her own research from a full set of methodological skills. Um, I just think those those kinds of questions, along with the fact that through different um, intellectual journeys, we all came to um, some shared concerns about um, idealized theory. And um, I'll have you know that across the world and even among engineers, the um, the trolley problem is alive and well, and in now we're doing it as an artificial car. Maybe you've taught it with the how should we program the, the electric car, but it's quite a problematic um, uh, framework in part because it's so tenacious and it is migrated into these other spaces.
maybe as I graduate folks, I can ask Monique to lead the facilitation. Okay, sure. I, I think there's no questions that have come up in the chat yet. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it would be great to hear from from some of you who who do grounded grounded theory, uh, engaged theory, um, whether whether you think this that it's a good resource to have to like, are you are you looking to to connect with other uh, people doing grounded theory and this very loose uh, um, format that we have this engaged theory community website, if that is something that is going to be useful for you. I, I see uh, Hans, sure. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I, I can say a little something about my own work, but I also have a question to everyone. So first of all, thanks for the presentations and sharing all your insights. Um, I'm so excited to be here and that this event is taking place. So also thank you for organizing it. Um, I came to this idea of a, a more grounded approach to normative theorizing only about uh, around two years ago. So I'm quite new. Um, so, so very excited to be here. Um, so what I did, I developed um, a grounded theorizing project with a new methodology, which I call democratic theorizing. I'm coming very much from democratic theory and the observation that democratic theory is done in a very undemocratic manner. So um, I've tried to employ grounded theory, but also participatory research methods um, in the project theorizing life and democracy and this normative idea of a living democracy together with activists from the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I can also maybe later sh share the, the link to the project if anybody's interested. Um, so um, it was a very, for me, a very enriching uh, and, uh, and a great experience trying this out in conversation with activists um, to, to generate this kind of theory, normative theory. And I think that's the important point here. Um, so my question to everyone on the panel or anybody else who would like to, to share insights would be, how, how are you dealing with publications with getting this kind of work out? Because I felt um, I've, I've written a paper, I've sent it somewhere, I've gotten very harsh reviews and I think that I've, you know, I've, I've tried really hard and I feel like the paper was quite good. At least that was my um, feeling. And I feel like the reviewers just came from a very different angle and they came from this qualitative angle of like, you know, evaluating the quality of qualitative um, research. And I, I just feel like it's very hard to get reviewers that understand this kind of work just because it's very marginal. So I'd just like to ask you about your experiences, your ideas, how can we deal with these kind of problems? Thank you. Um, Fauna? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess my um, my comments sort of intersect with Hans's in a way because I was I was moved by something that Deva said about the struggles she had in the early stages of her career and the similar struggles I'm witnessing in my own students. I mean, I couldn't do this kind of work until I had tenure and I was safely ensconced in the university and I knew they couldn't do anything to me, right? And then I was able to sort of break the boundaries of what it meant to be a political scientist. I'm often called a social worker because I engage with people in the community and I'm thinking, as you put it, Deva, about world building in collaboration with people who are on the front lines of struggle. And to an uncurious, scientist or bureaucrat, that looks an awful lot like service. It looks like charity. It looks like top-down sort of noblesse oblige from the university to engage people who are in struggle. And I've, you know, so th these, we are operating so many of us in the kind of interdiscipline, right? And it's very difficult to find places for our work. I mean, one of the, one of the things that the GNT group with, with Brooke and, and Genevieve and all of us early on is, we were trying to carve out a new space for people who also felt sort of like misfits within political theory, within empirical political science. And so many of us were sort of moving in and out of political science itself into anthropology and history and economics and, and, and social theory. And, and so, I mean, I think we're sort of in the beginning. I mean, many of us have faced this for a long time, but I think we see ourselves anyway, those of us who began this, 
this sort of conversation a few years ago is trying to open up new spaces for conversation and publication and to connect dots that might not have you know, been connected before. I have to say um, just a, a big shout out to MIT Press, um, who is publishing my next book because of their willingness to think beyond conventional disciplines and um, and 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 think more creatively about external review and who this kind of work should be sent to. There's, there's more to say. I look forward to saying more about my work this afternoon. I think, yeah, we're going to hear um, from Fauna this afternoon. There is um, an advantage to taking the book format. It makes space um, for, I mean, we all recommend um, Diva's appendix where she works through some of this. Um, and because in the book format, you do get space. Uh, some of us worked very hard, Fauna, Genevieve, Chris, Anshu Viner, um, and Lou Cabrera to uh, write an article that came out in CRISP that helped um, frame out this work in an article context. But we'll all admit that that was quite a journey, not just because it was collaborative, but because we had the audience problem you, you, you're talking about. Other presses, Angela Knopko is on um, the call. She's from Oxford University Press and Minnesota University Press has published Stacey Clifford Simplican's work um, that centers uh, people with disabilities and particularly actually her work, cognitive disabilities. So I think there's an idea that um, because we care so much about um, epistemology and how people know and affirmations of our own knowledge, uh, I mean, you know, a community's own knowledge and competing knowledges, as, as Monique referred to with regard to Eve Tuck's work, that might mean that we're privileging a certain way of thinking and doing politics, um, that like philosophers, privileges knowledge over doing, um, or some philosophers might want to do. Um, and I think her book and others that um, the University of Minnesota Press has published push back, push back on that set of assumptions. Katya. Thank you, Katia Confortini. Um, I first of all, I want to apologize in advance. I have a meeting of my AAUP chapter, and I'm the president, so I'm gonna have to scoot out <laughs> early. Um, talking of uh, scholar activists, um, I guess that my question for you all is how you navigate your own institutions, because one thing is to create interdisciplinary communities, and um, grounded normative theory communities across disciplines in big universities and especially research universities. I teach at a liberal arts college and it's our, it's um, that's a totally different setting and navigating the power politics in there is very different. I imagine also for teaching based universities also uh, difficult and I'm curious to see how you handle that. Does somebody want to pick up on that? Diva, would you like to? Sure, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to underline what you said about books. Um, I, um, you know, journal articles in a certain way, the gatekeeping that happens in journals is much more severe, I think, and, tr and conservative um, than is what's possible in books. And once ideas are out there in books, I feel like you have more opportunities to publish shorter pieces um, that in a variety of different formats from journal articles, because one, you have an idea of how to be concise because all of, you know, most of what you wanna say is out there, you know what I mean? Um, and then also you can decide whether you want to do scholarly journals or other kinds of public writing as well. Um, and so in addition to the presses that were mentioned, um, Oxford, both of my books are with Oxford um, and um, Minnesota Duke is also um, a wonderful um, place to look at for this kind of work. Um, um, so, you know, I would say thinking about the book format as an initial sort of go um, is, is, is wonderful. And then the other thing I would say is that I have always tried to create um, institutional um, touch points for um, um, 
knowledge sharing, right? Um, and this is actually knowledge um, sort of um, modeled on the work that um, Danielle Allen did when I was a graduate student at, at University of Chicago, who um, she was like very interested in um, sharing knowledge resources between communities and universities and trying to create institutional spaces and pathways to do that. Um, um, thinking about what it meant to share knowledge resources in a way that was not about um, noblesse oblige or charity or teaching or education, but instead was about um, you know, different sources of knowledge and being able to develop mutually beneficial relationships that would last over time. Um, and so I found myself trying to mimic um, and expand that model in whatever institutions that I'm at. And I think that those kinds of experiences, um, when you're able to include other people who are in your institution, uh, can really open up possibilities and understanding in a way that sort of um, doing the work by yourself might not, right? Um, or through your own like connections that, that, um, that colleagues may not be able to interface with. Um, you know, might not. So I've, I've gotten buy-in before um, by creating projects, right? So for example, um, co-constitutive um, co like learning projects, doing seminar classes that are partnered with a community organization where students are both learning and in the field doing something in the course of one course. Um, and then students are so excited about it and then other people sort of hear about it and then we do some kind of, um, um, you know, tangible project at the end that other people can experience. Um, and then also creating, if possible, um, you know, uh, touch points for community uh, activists and organizers to come into schools, into our institutions on a kind of ongoing basis. Um, I was fortunate to be able to do an activist in residence position at the new school. Um, and some other universities have these positions and they're basically semester or year long positions in which um, activists uh, and organizers get to engage in some kind of intellectual project um, and um, sort of interact with the university community. Um, you know, um, our activist in residence ended up holding office hours with students and actually now teaches as an adjunct in our first generation um, college program. So it was like very fruitful. And this is partly because um, organizers and activists are often, I mean, are very intellectual, right? They're, they're doing theorizing um, as they're doing their work, um, but often that work is not um, supported, um, not just by um, our institutions, but also within movement spaces, because the idea is you got to react, you got to, so creating spaces in university settings, which are all about thinking, right, um, is actually quite beneficial um, for um, organizers and activists to be able to take it a step back and do projects um, that are about critical reflection and to be sort of like to deepen their understanding, their vision, their knowledge, and then take that back to their work. Thanks, Diva. We are um, <clears throat> in our last five minutes and um, this has been just incredibly fruitful. However, Katya raised a question um, specifically about liberal arts colleges. And I'd like to see if, um, first of all, I love the, I don't know everybody on the call. I love that um, there are some familiar faces and some really new faces. And I'm wondering if anyone on the call is um, in the liberal arts and in one of these settings, um, well, Fana will be talking in four hours about working in a context where she doesn't feel her work is um, recognized by her department, though it's recognized globally, um, and it's certainly recognized by her institution more broadly. Um, but I think there might be uh, particular things that you might be experienced with with regard to um, the liberal arts context. And if, if you are in that context, do you want to speak up, unmute yourself? Gotcha, that might be telling in and of itself. <laughs> One of the things, yeah, Catherine, go ahead. Um, I wasn't going to speak to the liberal arts because obviously I'm, I'm at McGill, which is, you know, not a liberal arts college. Um, but I, I wanted to say something about, um, you know, publications and and uh, sort of how to be an engaged political theorist. Like, obviously, we're political theorists, but we're also, you know, citizens of countries, uh, people living in a certain time and so on. So how to be um, a politically conscious citizen. Um, and so I think of 
academic publications as about like talking to the academic community of people, you know, doing political theory. And as I explained with my book, you know, that's why the main critique of my book was one about transitional justice theorists. It was not about people necessarily practicing transitional justice, although hopefully some of them got that message as well, but it was mainly a, a scholarly book that was aimed at people theorizing justice and reconciliation, you know, and helping policymakers perhaps be engaged. But, but I was really asking them to do something more, you know, fundamental in terms of understanding, you know, what their limits were in ignoring structural injustice or colonial injustice. Um, but, you know, when I want to make an impact, like actually use my research to have an influence on real world events, for example, you know, McGill's men's varsity teams was called the Redmen, which was a reference to a you know, racially pejorative term of Indigenous peoples. I wrote an op-ed, um, you know, to the principal to say she had to change the name, which she did. Um, I didn't, of course, only do that. I also wrote to her in other, uh, you know, other channels as well in the McGill community. But that's my point is like, you know, if you want to influence like how people in the world see something, I, I think that's not about publishing an article in a journal. It's, it's about publishing op-eds or it's about local activism within your own institution. Um, and, and that's fine, you know, these are very powerful, but, but the objective I think is very different from when you try to publish a book um, or a journal article, right? That is really about the community of scholars trying to do research in, in a certain thing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I understand it. Uh, but I'm, I wouldn't call myself an activist, but I think we all, of course, have responsibilities and, you know, should say things when, when we can, you know, um, which is often informed by our own research as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, what's going on in the chat is that we're realizing we're end of time, but when we posed a really a big question, which is about how big is this tent and how um, how do we understand what's in the tent, um, the bigger we make the tent. I think that's one of the conversations that folks who are engaged in this work wrestle with all the time. The, the point is not to define it and to delimit it, but to give it enough parameters so that pe people can join in the conversation about how to do any work we do um, better, whether we do it under this moniker or not. I think because in the interest of time, wanting to um, wanting to stick to time, what I'll invite everyone to do is join us again at three o'clock um, or uh, or commit to making sure that we raise that question in the next session so that we can continue the conversation and have the two um, the two webinar webinars succeed together in um, in wrestling with some of these um, initial launching questions. I can't thank you enough for joining us. We will, as we've said in the chat, but we will um, uh, share the bibliographies that have been shared today. And there is a working bibliography on the website already. Um, but as you know, some of the folks who, some of the influences that we have are more broad than, um, than folks who would themselves identify themselves as, uh, as doing this kind of work. Many of us are reaching outside of these fields, as you know. So please join us for future conversations. And if you have an idea about the shape that some of these should take, please reach out. Um, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to have further conversations. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye.